this field because it gives us a general view on the opportunities in mathematical model of biolo biological systems. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Th Thank you for the kind invitation. Thank you for attending. So um, the seminar will be a uh, personal view because uh, I'm obviously not knowledgeable in all everything, which is mathematical models in biology. So uh, this seminar is divided in three parts. It will be very colloquial. Right? So the first part is just a general view of mathematics in biology. The second part is some, uh, I will concentrate on the second and the third part and things that I know better, which is m models and epidemics, epidemical uh, uh, outbreak modeling. And the second part, I will show you some, some works that we have done in our group. And the last part, I want to discuss some challenges in the field. Okay. So, here, oops, here are some, some uh, uh, areas of biology where mathematics is, uh, has been used uh, uh, since, since more than one century, let's say. So I started with uh, ecology and epidemiology, which are the things that I understand better. So in ecology, you have uh, usually the kind of system you, you study, you study a population of a certain species, or, and you want to know how the size of this population uh, uh, changes over time, and how it changes in space, on the locations. Okay? So this introduces naturally partial differential equations, ordinary differential equations, and uh, to study the populations. Then you, you want also to study in how interactions uh, between different species uh, modify the populational levels. And, uh, and then, well, there are many kinds of interactions. There are the called trophic interactions, which is consumption one species by the other. Then there are competitive uh, um, interactions, mutualistic uh, interactions, and all of this can be codified usually with ordinary or uh, partial differential equations. And this can also be done using stochastic processes, stochastic dynamics, and also individual-based models, which are very frequently used in, in ecology. So what are the problems that are of present interest? So there are many, obviously. But one that I want to mention is, is uh, something which is called spatial ecology. Spatial ecology is how the space, spatial dimension, affects the populations. And in particular, uh, when, you stay, if, when you speak about uh, space and ecology, space is not homogeneous in the sense that space is the habitat. And the habitat may be better in one place than another. Okay? Or even there can be places where the population cannot cannot reproduce, for instance, it can only diffuse. So space may be heterogeneous, and one very important problem that has been studied is how the fragmentation of the habitat affects the populational levels of the species, affects the equilibrium between different species. How can fragmentation uh, uh, promote invasions by alien species which may be they are better, for instance, in, in fragmented uh, areas because they can maybe uh, cross from one fragment to the other easier than the resident species or something like that. So this is one of the, of the focus uh, uh, subjects that uh, are being studied in, in spatial ecology. And it's very applied also because it, fragmentation is very... Uh, widespread. If you look for the Atlantic uh, uh, Atlantic forest here in Brazil, it's essentially a fragmented habitat. And all small, small fragments, and then they have the species that uh, live in these uh, fragments, and they cross the fragments, and then there are ones that can cross easier than others. Okay. So in epidemiology, uh, there's also this kind of mathematical formalism that I, I, I've just written there. I will discuss this later because that will be the focus point of my seminar in a few minutes. Then there's also the discussions, uh, mathematical modeling of uh, evolution, which goes usually through uh, 
uh, uh, game theory, and uh, also ordinary differential equations and, and individual-based models. Individual-based models, so you have a computer model, okay, where, where you, you consider individuals, and they have rules how to interact or to move or, uh, or take actions. And then you put a lot of, of individuals, and then you run programs, run the code to see what happens with this population okay, under different constraints. Okay? So uh, um, to give an example of what is important in, uh, in, in evolution that has been studied mathematically, for instance, is the process of speciation. Speciation means the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the the production of new species. Right? So you have a species, and um, then there are so many species, so they, they, everybody knows that they are somehow related, and they came one from the other. And, but how is this process going on? So one of the things is that there, there are many ways to have new species. For instance, one is geographic separation, so the species on one side of the mountain, and the other species are on the other side of the mountain, they cannot cross, they will go on their evolution for a long time, and then they, uh, uh, at a certain point, they are not anymore the same species. That's the classical, it's called uh, a parapatric uh, speciation. But um, then there are, there is a process also which involves natural selection, but there's also something which is called genetic drift, which is just having a species in a certain region that can move and can reproduce, has a genome, and has some uh, 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 mutations, which are rare, but over time they may accumulate, and then you have, without any spatial separation, you have new species appearing. So this is a work from a uh, specialist of this, is uh, one of our, our uh, friends, uh, Marcus Aguiar from Unicamp. Uh, immunology is something uh, where it's studied like population biology, but with different laws. When the, I mean, all the elements of the immune systems are given in terms of concentrations and then in reactions and so on. So I'm, I won't talk much about this uh, thing because I don't work with this. Uh, physiology is uh, also... Um, uh, 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 a subject where mathematics is important, for, for instance, for modeling of cancer, uh, uh, cancer processes in, in, in your body. Okay? They, these are usually uh, kind of reaction diffusion equations. You have the diffusion and, um, and, uh, of, of a certain species, a certain kind of uh, cells, and so on. So that, that's one, but it could also be uh, physiology can also be some more macroscopic things like, like uh, abilities to, like uh, biomechanics and so on. Right? So abilities to fly or to, to walk. Neuroscience is, uh, uh, over the last uh, 30 or 40 years has come to rise as a one very important area uh, in biology. There's a lot of work going on with uh, statistical physics and a lot of computational uh, uh, work and, uh, and uh, still, I would say, it's still at the beginning of this subject. And then, obviously, genetics, uh, which is a little bit different from from the usual setting of uh, differential equations. And so on. It's much more about computer sciences and um, probability and uh, this kind of things. Right. So, okay, that's. Very general view of uh, areas where mathematics has been used, uh, successfully used, and has given contribution in biological system. It's not exhaustive, obviously. Okay. So, 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 okay, okay, okay. So, okay. So, let me now talk a little bit about models in. Uh, to, uh, for epidemics, okay? So, epidemic models 101 is something that most of you have probably seen due to COVID and so on. Everybody has heard about it. But just to mention, usually what you have is you take a population and you divide the population in classes. So, with respect to their state, with respect to the, to the disease. 
So you can be susceptible, means that you can catch the disease. Uh, you can be infected and infectious at the same time. I mean, you, you have the disease and you can transmit. And uh, you can then get uh, recovered, okay? And uh, this is uh, usually modeled by uh, ordinary differential equations. You say that the rate of change of susceptibles and uh, over time is something proportional to the number of susceptibles times the number of infectious uh, people. And uh, all of these that are susceptible and uh, leave the susceptible uh, class go into the infected class. And then after some time, they will leave the infected class to go to the recovered class. Okay? So that they can die also, yes. But uh, well, th th in this case, I'm taking the case, well, this is a closed population, for instance. So if you can, you, if you want to have a, a, a system where pe people actually die, but they also they are born also. <laughs> so usually then uh, most, most models uh, will look at this as a balance between death and birth. So the population stays constant which simplifies the problem. And this is usually okay because the, the change of the population uh, uh, to be important takes, takes many years, and uh, usually epidemics don't take many years. Okay. So it's a good approximation. Okay. So, well, then, then you get it probably. Yet, uh, okay, Th this is, uh, is the, the, is this working? Yeah. This is, this is uh, the, the solution to this equation. So you, have to, uh, you start with everybody uh, susceptible and some epsilon, uh, a very small number of infectious uh, people. Then you have an infection and a curve of uh, up and down, which is the number of uh, infected people. Susceptibles decrease and the recovered only increase. And you see that at the end, in this example, at the end, when the number of infected people already got to zero, you mean the epidemic is over, there are still susceptible people. Not everybody gets the, the disease. So this is the, for this simple model, this main, 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 main result of this simple model is that not everybody gets a disease of this kind, if it's an SIR. Obviously, if you don't have recovered people, and the people, uh, 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 just get back to being susceptible, then you can have everybody uh, with the disease. But if you have recovered it, people, then not everybody gets the disease. Right? And uh, so this is kind of burnout of the, of the epidemic. So more complicated models, you see, more, more compartments. Okay? Maybe you have people that have been exposed, they are infectious, but they don't have the symptoms. If you separate this infectious into, into exposed, but, and uh, if you want to call it asymptomatic, or depends a little bit on. And, and then you have the infectious, I mean, people that are actually infectious, in infected, and, 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 uh, and have the disease. So this is something which is uh, easy to do. Then you can have. Partial recovery, recovery after, after sometimes people lose immunity, then you get recovered going back to susceptibles. Well, and for models that are actually something which is uh, as useful, is uh, uh, you need more classes. For instance, hospitalized people, hospitalized people, um, asymptomatic, and so on. And depending on on the pathogen you're studying on, on the disease, maybe you need to take each of these compartments and divide it by age classes. For instance, for COVID, this is important because the, the effects of COVID are different in children, in adults, on elderly, and the, the rate of, of, of death is different. So you have to have, divide your population by age classes. Okay? So this makes the number of equations grow very fast. So, okay. So there, there's a problem. You, you usually want to fit the, I mean, the, the, uh, the lowest number of parameters you can. So you have things that you have from data, from observations. There are things 
you know, you know on the, the range. Okay? So all of this, I, I won't go into this, but all of this has to go through an analysis with, with error bars, with uh, everything, and with, uh, so in order to make sense. Okay? And, um, and one parameter that you never know is the beta, okay? which is the, the, the can, you can think it's, it's proportional to the probability that if a susceptible person meets an infected person, what's the probability that the person gets infected? Okay? So this is not, you cannot know this beforehand. So beta is always fitted in the models. Okay? What you should do, however, is not to do overfitting. Overfitting is very, very bad. So one typical overfitting problem is people that go to here say that, OK, let beta depend on time. And on every step, I, I fit a beta in time. If you are doing this on a daily basis, and uh, over one year, you have 365 parameters, which is overfitting, which will fit perfectly the curve, but will predict nothing at all. Okay? So there is a kind of art of being reasonable with the fittings. Okay? So usually you'd say, I want a, 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 a beta that is either constant, or maybe in the winter it's a little bit higher than in the summer, but not fitting it every day or every week. Okay? Yeah. For example, for No. So uh, predictions. Uh, so that, that's something that people. Uh, influenza is a very difficult uh, disease to study because you don't have good data. Because if you get uh, you get a disease, you stay at home. You know, it doesn't go to any doctor, and therefore, why well, you don't the public health data does not show it. <laughs> okay. What public health data will show is is hospitalization of people. Okay? So that's a proxy. And um, so there are people that have run very big programs that take everything they, they can into it. It's Google search, it's climate, it's everything you want, and, uh, and, and, uh, and um, uh, machine learning things, and trying to predict the next season. But not, not the number of cases, it's just will be important or not, and so on. The same thing is, for instance, dengue. Dengue, what we have here, and then that's actually something that uh, we are working at, is, is to try to say, what makes it that some years you have much more than other years? Is it just climate? But it's not just climate, OK? There's something else. So what are the, the motors of this? It's usually difficult to, to understand. And it would be very important to understand, for instance, if you talk about influenza or even of dengue or anything, because even if you cannot avoid it sometimes, you can prepare the public health, uh, hospitals and so on. This, this year we need more, more uh, beds or whatever, more doctors. So that was a very simple model, what I showed. And this model is good because we can define one important parameter, which is called R0, which is the reproductive number, the basic reproductive number, which is the number of, uh, of secondary cases that one primary case creates. Okay? So if R0 is, is bigger than one, means that you have a, an epidemic, because each case creates more than one okay, in average. And uh, one thing about this uh, R0 is that in, in the simple models, you can relate R0 with the final size of the epidemic. What's the final size of the epidemic? Is the number, after, if the epidemic goes extinct, after it goes away, there will be a certain number of people that had the disease. And this is called the final size. Okay? And the final size is connected to R0. It's a very elegant result for many, many models. And uh, it's something, a curve like that. Okay? So that's allows you to say, if I have 
measured, but at the beginning, R0 can be measured at the beginning, right? But it tells you something about how bad the things can be in the future, right? R0 is the number of secondary cases that one primary case will infect, right? So, on average, right? Uh, no, with, with immunity, but, uh, but wow, okay, at, at, uh, at the time zero, no immunity, okay. So R0 is, uh, is uh, no, it's not constant. R0, I mean, people, when I say at the beginning there's no immunity, but immunity people will build up because people will get immunity, okay? So the number of secondary cases that a primary case will infect will depend on time. Which is called the RT. Okay. So, uh, okay, but real world is like that. Nothing like the beautiful curves. Yes, this is the uh, uh, COVID-19 epidemic curve in Sao Paulo, and it goes up and down. And you see that probably, uh, if you want to uh, use models, to do something helpful. Uh, which can be used by uh, decision makers, you will have to do be much better than the simple models. Okay. So, uh, and here, this is, uh, again, it's only severe cases because for COVID-19, we don't know the number of cases. Okay, people that get the disease, and it's not notified by the system, even if they go to a, to a hospital or to a doctor. If it's, it's a mild case, then it's not notified. So it get, doesn't get into the system. Uh, everything that goes, I mean, most things that go into the system of notification are hospitalized case, and that's what we have and as, a, as data that, are, they, they can, we can actually work with. Right? So uh, now, come on, OK. Let me give you, uh, very shortly, two examples of models uh, used uh, by uh, our group uh, worked on and uh, give you some taste of what the kind of uh, problems that uh, we have worked uh, in, in the Brazilian context. I mean, Brazilian context means data from Brazil. Okay. So, first is calculating RT. RT is the number of secondary cases that the primary case infects at a certain time of t. So R0 was at the beginning, and this is the secondary. It is, it's at a certain point of time. OK? So, and people were eager to estimate this always, because they want to know it's bigger or not than one. OK? Are we already decreasing? Are we, what is the situation? Okay? So uh, the first thing is RT uh, uh, can be calculated without any model, actually. You don't need a compartmental model. You just uh, define RT as the number of secondary cases that the primary cases infects. And then with some elegant uh, mathematics, you come to this expression where I, well, I should not have used I here. I is not the same I as an SIR. I is the incidence, the number of new cases per day. Okay? Number of new cases per day. And which is something you know. Okay? Uh, for instance, when you look at SIR model, you don't know S usually, because you don't know I. I is the number of people that are infected at that at a certain moment of time. I, you don't know this. Uh, usually, what you know is through the notification system how many new cases you have per day. Okay? So the number of new cases per day it's it's the kind of of data that exists, and um, and then you have to know which is something. This is this uh, W which is the distribution of zero time. Zero time is the following. Say I, I am, uh, uh, I just uh, uh, got infected, okay? No, better, I got my first symptoms, okay? And then I infect somebody, and this person will have the first symptoms some days later. So this time, between the first symptoms of one person to the other person is called the zero time, okay? And there's a distribution, because not everybody has the same exactly. It's not, okay? So there's a distribution of serial times. Okay? So knowing this, you can calculate R of T. 
Okay, nice. It seems everything is, is just fine. But well, things turned out to be uh, uh, much more complicated uh, because, uh, well, now you are interested in an epidemic that is just going on, like COVID. Okay, it's not a past epidemic. Okay, so you have problem with your data. You don't know. Actually, I, uh, in Brazil, what you know is the number of severe cases, so you have the I for the severe cases, okay? Which you can think it's a proxy of the total number. It's reasonable. Okay, but then you have a problem, which is every case has to have a date in order to have number of new cases today, so every case has a date. What is the date of the case? Okay. So the first thing is people announce usually, government announces, the number of new cases have been notified today. Okay. But this is, 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 is not an epidemic parameter, an uh, epidemic variable. It's an administrative, depends on the notification system. Okay. They can, they can take, in Brazil, there are places it takes three weeks to notify one case. So you should actually do something better is you should connect one date and one case with the date of first symptoms. Actually, you would like to connect it with the date of infection, but nobody knows exactly when it was infected, but people know the date of first symptoms. And so then you should report it to the date of first symptom, which is in the database of COVID cases. It is. It, it, but Notifications have delays, and so uh, you have to have the notification to know the, the, the date of your symptoms. Okay? So you are always late. So you have this delay between the symptom onset and the notification. Okay? So what you have to do is use statistical, it's usually Bayesian uh, analysis and so on, and I, I, I'm not really a specialist on this, but knowing the distribution of delays between onset of symptoms and notification, and having some notifications going on already, you can estimate the number of new cases today, which is called now casting, which is a, is a kind of joke with forecasting, but it's not for, it's just uh, now, okay? So you, you, actually it's not so much now, it's like um, five days ago. Okay? And uh, so you, you have to first do the now casting and then calculate RT over the now casted things, okay? So if you look, at this is uh, it's a plot from, again, for Sao Paulo, and you see that there's uh, some, some data which was in, in red. Uh, these are now casted data. If you, if you look at the data, at the raw data, there's just a, a sudden jump going almost to zero, right? which is not real. It's just the fact that there are delays. Right? So you, you estimate this, and, uh, and uh, so you have to do this now casting. So this is something important if you are modeling for outbreaks that are taking place now. Okay? If it's in the past, all data is consolidated. You don't need anything of this. But if it's outbreak, you need it now. And you have these delays, and you have to, to go to the statistical methods to estimate how many cases you have. I have a question. Yeah. These red, these red dots uh, are, estimate. are estimates. And, um, but when I compare this part of the curve with the, with the say, the second peak from, from this point mm -hmm. uh, behind, I don't see this plateau. I see this going downwards, right? The fast, yeah. fast decreasing. Well, th this was the estimate. I don't know. Uh, why. So, okay. What I mean is we are predicting somehow a different decay in comparison to previous I, I didn't show you the credibility interval. Oh, what, sorry? There's a credibility interval. There are error bars around, okay? okay? Now, this is just uh, the, 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 that's something we, that, that we actually, a site that we build and for, for, big, for large public. 
Okay, so there are error bars and so on. And, uh, no, you obviously test it if our using the past, if our now casting is, is okay. okay. But then there has been validation before. Okay, so once you have this, then you can calculate RT, and then this is a typical thing that you have. For instance, for Sao Paulo, it is always uh, the, 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 the line is uh, R equal to 1 and uh, has been bumping up and down around. Uh, so it can increase because uh, usually we get variants and so on. This is uh, from the beginning until March. Until this, I think this is February uh, 21, 22. Yeah, at the beginning of 23, um, until January, February. Yeah, there had this, we had some small bump. So now let me comment on, on this, because, um, uh, OK, so this is our site, if you are interested. It's called Observatory COVID Zenobi uh, Berry. And uh, so the point about this RT is uh, you cannot use it blindly, because when you are at the very beginning, you have a lot of susceptibles and so on. So knowing R, R0 or RT at the beginning, it's important because you can estimate how dangerous the, this can be, actually, because it's connected to the final size. And uh, then you can keep on the progress of, of, the, of the epidemic by looking at RT. But once you are back to some very low level of, of, of uh, infections, then sometimes a small outbreak will get you an RT um, bigger than one, and therefore you should have more, and, and, and this is, should not trigger an alarm saying everybody has to stay at home and so on because it's localized. But as the, the baseline is very, a very small number, any small outbreak in some place will give you an RT. So RT is, is it, it's an, in, an interesting um, uh, uh, parameter to use in, for decision making about the epidemics, but not necessarily it is this only parameter. It has to be part of a bigger set of parameters that can actually evaluate the best actions at a certain point of time. Yeah. So, <coughs> Okay, so let me just give the second uh, example, which is, is about the cases that, um, uh, of COVID-19 in the city of Manaus at the beginning of 2021, which has been uh, known as a very catastrophic situation. And there has been a, a, a discussion about because Manaus had already had lots of cases before. And there was an estimate that 78% of the population had COVID in October. So you don't say, well, it will be difficult to have a new epidemic there because there are so many immune people. But what we didn't know in 2020 was about Veining immunity. Im immunity doesn't for stay for a long time. And if you have variants, sometimes you are not immune at all. Okay? So th this was not known. So there had been a very, I mean, a very uh, a big discussion about this result of 78%, which was based on, 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 on examining COVID uh, uh, infections with blood donors. Okay. And so what we know now is that there was a new variant, which is called what's called the P1 and then gamma variant and so on, and uh, which was responsible for this super high peak and all the catastrophic things that we had. And uh, so what we did is 
We worked on, worked on a model which has the wild, uh, the resident variant, and the gamma variant, which is the invading variant. And um, in order to estimate two things. One is how, how, uh, uh, how many times is, is the gamma variant more infectious than the wild one? And how many um, reinfection cases are, can be attributed to the gamma variant? Yeah? So these are things that we wanted to know. So what we had is the incidence, the number of new cases per day for uh, COVID-19, and the proportion of cases due to the gamma variant, okay? because there are people that were doing surveillance, uh, genomic surveillance at that time. Okay? So we were out on, we have a model which we call the medium complexity model, which you have uh, the susceptibles, and you have here in compartment for, for the uh, uh, variant, which is the, the resident variant, and this is the invading, this is gamma. And uh, after being exposed, people can get to the hospital, get asymptomatic, or just have symptoms, and, uh, but not go to the hospital. Uh, both cases are the same, then now some of uh, we suppose that the deaths are only related to the hospitalized cases, then you can get recovered, recovered, but the recovered from one can get infected by the second one. Okay? So, and then all of this is divided in three age classes, from zero to more than 20, to 20 to 60, and over 60, because um, Mortality is strongly dependent on, on ages. Yeah. So you do this, and then you do data fitting and a lot of things, and you see that the number of authors starts to increase. There's many different uh, things you have to know, and people that do, do the fitting, people that do know the more about the epidemiology, and, the, and so on. And so, what we found with this, come on, ah, okay. Oof. So the data we had was actually uh, the epidemic curve, which are the the black dots, and uh, this uh, shadow here is what uh, our model predicts. And then uh, you have also the number of wild, uh, uh, the proportion of wild cases to the. Uh, gamma variant cases. Here, uh, this is the proportions. So this is the data that you actually have. Okay. And uh, you, know, should you go for, for fitting and so on, and I don't want to take much time about this. And um, come on. Sorry, Roberto, what's calculated and what's, what are data? Data are the, the, are the dots. Okay, and and, and uh, the calculated is this. Okay, this uh, this this strip here. Right? And okay, so I think I have to go for this here. Easier. So these are uh, the results. But uh, what what uh, what is important for us here is that the relative transmission rate for the new variant is two point six times the the transmission rate for the old variant. Okay, so it's relative. Okay, so it's uh, much more infectious, much more, okay? two point six times. And then they have the, the the credibility intervals and so on. And well, what is nice that from this you can calculate also the number of estimated reinfections. And what we uh, calculated is, is that 28% of the Manaus cases in the period, which goes from 1st November until 31, 31st January, which is the data we used, 28% um, of the cases were reinfections. So you, you have to have reinfections in order to understand what happened in Manaus. Okay? And actually, one thing that we also calculated is that, that, which was a free parameter, was the number of people that already were immune to the, 
to the wild uh, uh, variant at the beginning of November, and actually we got the 78% that people had shown to, I mean, had estimated from blue donors data. And uh, so this 28%, then actually there has been people, again, again working with blue donors, which is the group of Esther Sabino from USP, and um, actually went on to calculate how many reinfections they have. This was estimated later, and actually our results are okay with that. So the, the explanation for what, what happened with, with, with in Manaus is that it's a combination of reinfections and highly transmissible um, uh, strain and variant. Right? So that's, that's one explanation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, uh, it is, uh, in principle, it, well, this one with gamma variant is not comparable because, I mean, it, it would be comparable to other cities in Brazil. No, outside other places uh, but, in the yeah, world. But gamma was essentially here, okay? Ah, it was only in Brazil, okay. In something a little bit in Argentina, Peru, and so on. But gamma, did, it was a very important, and something that we don't understand is why did, didn't gamma go word oh, okay. to the word? That's something we don't understand. Okay? But probably at the same time that gamma was increasing here, you had delta in Europe. And maybe there's kind of competition between them. Okay? But for instance, people in in UK, they, they estimated this kind of things for delta, delta variant. Okay? okay, so these are the examples. And let me now just finish by talking about some of the perspectives in the area of mathematical modeling and epidemiology. So let me um, uh, state some of the problems that are difficult today. So one is having included in your models the fact that populations of uh, people or, or even for vector-borne, also mosquitoes and so on, are heterogeneous. Heterogeneous in, in, in which sense? Uh, people have, dif are, have different susceptibilities. Susceptibilities is, is how easy you, you get, you get uh, the, the disease. And uh, have different infectivities, how easily you transmit the disease. So that people that due to the immune system, due to uh, many things that, ha that have more propensity to either to infect or to be infected. Therefore, this will impact this, this parameter that uh, was the beta, which is the probability of actually getting uh, uh, infected if a susceptible meets an infected person. This beta should actually be a distribution. Okay. So there's not that, that, that this should take into account the fact that people are different and you cannot necessarily take the average infectivity and susceptibility. There are, in, there are important effects that can come from the fact that there's actually a distribution of susceptibility and infectiousness. And also, one of the important things is different exposures. So, For instance, exposure is very important for dengue or malaria. Because uh, <coughs> when you do models, one thing is you have to know which is the population at risk because it, it's it, it, what's the total population? Is it the population of the city or of the county or whatever? What, what are you modeling? Okay, so if a population is not at risk, should not be taken into account in the in the in the, in the model. Okay, so but even if you look at the level of a city, there are places where you have more exposure than others. If and this is typical for vector-borne, for insects. Okay? So this is our heterogeneities, which are spatial heterogeneities, okay? which are usually connected also to social determinants, uh, people having access to uh, uh, clear water or sanitation. And also social determinants are important for mortality, having access to uh, medical facilities or not. Okay? So all of this is heterogeneous. It's not constant, and the first approximation of all the models is to take it constant, but actually you should take this as some kind of distributions. Okay? 
So another thing which is important is the use of network theory. Now, network theory has been kind of wide for some time. So what are, how are networks used in, in epidemiology? Most of the time, each node of a network is a person. And you connect persons if they have contact. And then you have a network of contacts, and then you have the epidemic dynamics on that ne network. And well, this has been studied over 20 years ago. Maybe you have non-trivial networks. Non-trivial networks is kind of a network of people that are interested is that uh, uh, for a network, the number of connections I have is my degree. So you have a degree distribution okay, in the network. And usually in a, in a random network and so on, this will decay uh, uh, very fast for large degrees. But then you, sometimes you have structures in the, in the network which make it uh, have a, a long tail. So the decay is polynomial sometimes. Instead of being exponential, this is the kind of uh, thing that people have studied <coughs> a lot with networks in, in general and also in an epidemic. And, and then suddenly the structure of the network has importance about the parameters of your, of your equation. For instance, calculating the beta has, has some influence about the um, about, uh, from, from the structure of the network of contacts. So this has been explored pretty much very nice results. For instance, uh, if you have uh, uh, this kind of degree distribution with a, with a fat tail, then it's much easier for a pathogen to invade because you have super spreaders. But actually, the total size may be smaller than, than in the case of, of, of random things. Okay? So there are the interesting things, cases. And uh, maybe this is, can be very important. And sometimes, uh, if I, I don't have so much time, but I could speak at the end about uh, mpox, uh, monkeypox, which is connected probably to a problem with degree distribution of, uh, of contacts. But uh, the point is, most of the time, people do this and do not connect this to any data. It's nice. You publish in physical review, but what's the importance of this in actually explaining some epidemiological facts? Yeah? So the first thing is, which is very difficult is, okay, we have a network. And then go for an epidemiologist to say, what? You have a network? I don't have networks. People don't know things about contacts. Okay? So it is for us, uh, we think about networks as a, something that can be given, but then there are two questions, two points. First, what is contact? Okay, for, for respiratory uh, diseases, what is contact? I'm, I'm in contact with you or not? Okay, how long is my contact? Are everybody, is everybody in contact or not? So what's contact? Okay, so that's already a, a problem, okay? Depends on the, on the way, I mean, the, 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 the transmission type. One place where contact is defined for sexually transmitted diseases, it's a classical thing. But then you have a different problem. How do you know the network? Uh, well, you can't say, I'm naive and I go and ask people. Right? But you know, people lie. And especially related to sexual uh, things. So it is, it is not easy to know a network of people that had uh, partners, okay? And there are special, there's a, there's, a, there's a part of epidemiology that's called field epidemiology, which is about how you access actually this kind of data, okay? How, how you know who had contact, for instance. And you, and you used some, some techniques which is called pair navigation, which is the people that will actually do interviews are people that are also from the population that this is, is the object. Okay? For instance, if you were working with, with uh, for instance, transsexual people, then um, the people that do the interviews are also transsexual. So it creates trust, for instance. So yeah, a lot of things like this. And, and 
Obtaining this kind of networks, it's actually very difficult. What is easier to obtain is the degree distribution. People more or less will say, I had so many partners last year. Okay, this is better. But when you ask them to name the partners, then you have a problem. If people don't want it, they, they, they don't know you. And they say, I won't give you this data. Okay? So, one point is connecting network theory to real networks. It's not easy, and this is still a challenge. And well, then, this, then there's this kind of thing that we have been going through with COVID-19, and then it's the modeling <coughs> for surveillance and preparedness. So one thing is, for instance, uh, looking at historical uh, epidemics and uh, looking if models are, uh, can help you understand better what happened and so on. But sometimes you have the situation that you have just an outbreak of something new, for instance, like COVID-19 or something that can happen. And then you should have ways of doing, <coughs> contributing, using modeling, and uh, mainly also statistical analysis to assess the situation, which is different than models that look at, at historic epidemics. And this uh, needs the kind of, of things like now casting and uh, other techniques uh, uh, from sampling and uh, statistical sampling uh, in order to assess the situation of an outbreak at the beginning of something. Is it dangerous? Is it not dangerous? How, how, how worse, how, can it be very bad or not? Okay. So <clears throat> you have sparse data and have a lot of problems. So you have to try to integrate different sources of data. Sometimes you use Google searches or something and <clears throat> in, in order to access the situation. And finally, one, one interesting thing is also climate change and diseases. But this is very important usually for Diseases that are transmitted by animals, by insects, for instance. Insects, in the, uh, which are insect-borne uh, diseases like dengue, malaria, uh, yellow fever, and so on, they, have, they are related to climate change in a very important way to, because these insects do not regulate temperature. So they have a temperature difference, then all the metabolism of these insects will be different. If it's, it's hotter, then they have a... A, a faster metabolism and so on. So this in fact affects everything. And actually there have been studies which, which try to, to model which is, which is not the population of insects, but uh, just to say, is a population viable in a certain place with certain uh, meteorological conditions or climatic conditions, okay? And then you use this big, big models of uh, climate change and say, well, will the certain population of certain insects, will it be uh, shifting the range of occurrence or not? And in, in which direction? And how can this affect uh, the contact of this population of insects with other animals or with human beings? Okay. So this is typically a highly computational task because all in integrating all the climatic models, which are super big models and so on. But this is also one challenge to 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 model what could be the effects of changing climate in in the occurrence of, of diseases. So one example is which is, I mean, this has not been fully discussed, and that's one thing that we are actually in our group discussing, which is, for instance, the range of, of occurrence of dengue has been shifting south in Brazil. You didn't have dengue in Porto Alegre for 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and now you have. But it's very curious because you don't have every year. So you, there is the possibility to have, but you have every year you have the, the insects. But some years you don't have the epidemic on the insects. So what is happening? So that's kind of the region which is the fringe between occurrence and non-occurrence of, of, the, of the disease and, uh, and also the occurrence on, on non-occurrence of the insects. And uh, this has, can be affected by climate change, by 
or by land use change also. Uh, the different things, not only climate change. So what is going on? Is it going really south? You, you have, now you have dengue in Buenos Aires also, which you didn't. Okay? So there is a shift. And understanding this is still a change. So, okay, thank you. And that's all for me. Thank you, Roberto. So we have some time for questions. Yeah. There are many hands raised. Go ahead. So from your talk, it looks like most of the challenges are for social sciences. It's not really mathematical challenges. Is that correct? Well, uh, yeah. That it is, to a certain extent, that there are mathematical challenges with, with networks still. Okay. Uh, because you have, um, you have to look at, at networks that have time dependence in the, in the connections. And this is not well studied. Okay. But, uh, but yes, in, in many challenges are obtaining data that can be useful to inform your models. So are there simple uh, numbers like power laws or something that uh, came out of all this huge amount of data from COVID? Simple numbers. So power laws, no. I, mean, I, I, I don't know any about, didn't think about power laws or... Uh, something simple that you would say there is a power law with a factor 1.2 and then you will try to come up with an explanation for that. Something that is quantitative and that you could say, we have to explain this. Because yeah. Otherwise, it looks like if you have many parameters, how could we compete with Google, Facebook? I mean, these people have hundreds of people working for them. They're super specialists in models. They know all these networks that you are talking about. They, 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 are, they don't know all these networks, actually. No? Okay. No. So yeah, so what, what, what are the people that work with so much data? What are they missing compared to physicists? So one thing is uh, uh, people that do have sometimes too much data, actually. Uh, for instance, they, there's a lot of people doing machine learning. Okay? And uh, this sometimes misses the point in epidemiology, because so you still want to have not very simple models, but intermediate complexity, which means that you can still, uh, because with, with, for instance, with too much data, with using this kind of uh, artificial intelligence and things and so on, doesn't give you any insight about mechanisms. Okay? So you want to have mechanisms to understand what's going on, but you don't want to have it so simple that you cannot explain anything. So you have to have some intermediate range of, of complexity so that you can still talk about mechanisms and, and be more or less realistic about the, about the data about the, the model, can explain the data, and so on, so on. Yeah. Oh, okay, uh, I have a question here. Um, th there is a, um, I mean, one lesson that I got, got from your talk was that uh, you, you can make the models as complicated as you wish at the cost of overfitting or something like that, but there's a, an ingredient there that I would guess would be important which is the interplay between different diseases occurring at the same time. For instance, yeah. you can get a flu, your immune system goes down, and then you get more susceptible for getting COVID or something like that. Uh, what's your personal view of this? Is this being taken into account in the modeling in general, for instance, in these systems? Is it important or? So it can be important, yes. Uh, uh, for instance, this is very important in dengue because you have serotypes in dengue. Okay, which are not the different disease, but it's it's you are getting immune only for the serotype you got the disease. So there is a kind of of, of population dynamics of serotypes uh, of occurrence of serotypes. Okay, so uh, you, you get immune to serotype uh, one, and then and then at a certain point there's uh, appears a serotype four, then you are not immune to this one, or you are partially immune, and so on. So there's a competition between serotypes for dengue, for instance. It's a, it's a particular case, because there are four serotypes, and so on. And um, so interaction between different things, for instance, flu and COVID, didn't seem to have much uh, interaction, actually. Didn't, uh, I mean, th there was one interaction that is due to COVID, people stayed at home. 
and then you got less flu also. <laughs> okay? But it's not, this is a kind of socially mediated effect. Okay? But uh, yeah, there are people that, uh, that there are studies about uh, in, uh, uh, in host competition between, uh, between pathogens also, for instance. Co infection, if you can have co infections, it's different from if you don't have co infections, for instance, and this changes the dynamic. Can I just ask a question? So, what yeah. is the goal at the end? Is to be able to predict something, or a posteriori to explain what happened? Both before? things. So, for instance, for one of the, uh, the examples I, uh, I gave you, the second one was to try to uh, to understand why we could have such a big epidemic in Manaus, having the fact, knowing the fact that a lot of people already had. COVID with the wild strain. So one, one thing is, okay, let's see what's the best explanation for no, this number of cases. It turns out that it's a, co that's a combination of uh, a waning immunity or no immunity against the new, uh, 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 new variant uh, uh, together with a high infectivity of the new variant. Right? So that, that's one thing that's is, uh, try to explain what happened. But uh, you can also, for instance, with the, with the now casting and so on, you can do short-term uh, predictions also. We also, also, for instance, we can access a vaccine effectivity. And uh, for instance, one work that we have, uh, I didn't show you, it is a statistical uh, model. So saying how many um, in Brazil, knowing the the, the number of vaccines of each type and which effectivities that has been used, for instance, in the first months from, say, from January to August uh, 2021. And uh, how many lives have been saved by the use of the vaccines? You can calculate this because they were used only in a part of the population. So, And then you can also say how many lives more you could have saved if you started earlier. Okay? So this is something which is also important to know uh, uh, how many, how, how, how the vaccination uh, in a population has been important or not, right? how many lives and how many. So this is one thing that's an assessment of the situation. So long-term long -term, uh, uh, predictions are usually ruled out. Uh, if you look at the epidemic curve, you never predict that because there are so many facts that you cannot, so long term is not usually. Maybe they cannot because of privacy, but don't you think that, say, to estimate where the next dengue epidemic will be, that Google would be much better than uh, you could ever be? I mean, they, if they really wanted to estimate, they just need to see when people start searching for dengue. Yeah, you signals. can integrate this. I mean, people do integrate this, actually. And, and uh, there, there are people that do the integration of data from Google with, with the data from the field, from, mm -hmm. from actual um, notifications. Right? Uh, so there are people that do this kind of thing. It's not our group that doesn't work with that, but there are people that do uh, integration. That, that's why I was asking if, some, if there's something super quantitative, because if it's super quantitative, like a power law or something, then I understand, because otherwise, like the example of Manaus, why would we need, why couldn't a doctor or a lay person say it's probably because this variant, people were not immune? Because then getting a model that goes past those points, as you explained, if you put three or four parameters, of course you can fit a Gaussian, right? So if it's more or less qualitative, what is the advantage of having a model, right? If you just say, probably this is the mechanism, why is this better than writing some differential equations if they have four or five parameters? So. Uh, did, actually, we wrote the, the system of differential equations that have some, some small number of parameters to be I mean, three or four. Right? And this, uh, uh, you show that it's compatible with the explanations that, uh, that there could have been immunity before, but actually this immunity was not effective against, uh, against the new variants. Okay? So that's an explanation about, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's always a comp shows the compatibility of the hypothesis with the data and can be an important explanation. Okay? And then you go, for instance, people went to 
to, to test, okay, and actually what's okay. Okay, I have a last question before the, the, the coffee break. And concerning prediction about the future, it seems that it's difficult to predict the present, but still, when, I, when we see the peaks of the outbreaks, mm -hmm. we see that they are smaller and smaller as time passes. Can't, can't, can't you forecast something about the future that the next outbreak is going to be, you know? Yeah, the people have tried to see, I mean, I, our group actually tried to see, you do wavelet analysis, and so it's kind of sort of thing to see there are some regularities between the, uh, but, uh, well, uh, it didn't work, actually. It doesn't work. Well, uh, maybe, I mean, maybe you can make it work. You, looking at test epidemics, maybe you can test some ideas about this global patterns, okay? Maybe. But uh, so just some simple ideas about uh, periodicities or whatever, it uh, doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so th let's thank uh, Roberto again. There is some cakes and coffee upstairs. <laughs>